good good evening uh, sir and good evening madam and good evening uh, all the colleagues uh, i will introduce today speaker today speaker is dr prabhat nanayakkar uh, dr prabhat nanayakkar is a product of mahinda college gol uh, and he studied in the university of colombo faculty of medicine university of colombo uh and he did his uh, diploma in family medicine 2019 2020 batch and he did md family medicine in 2021 and now working as a uh, registrar in family medicine uh other than all these he is a excellent musician and singer so i will in, uh, invite dr prabhat to deliver his presentation Uh, Prabhat, over to you. Thank you very much, Lakmal, for that uh, kind introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure and a privilege to present in this elite forum of teachers and my colleagues. Today, I am going to present a case of hypertension, mainly focusing on the management because uh, last week we did hypertension in the young. and uh, some uh, theoretical part of the assessment and uh, complications thank you uh, Mr. S is a 42-year-old carpenter. I met at my family medicine appointment at DH Moratour, and he is from Kerala Valley. And uh, he present took to the OPD with on and off chest pain for three weeks. And uh, he incidentally found to have a blood pressure of 152 by 90 millimeters of mercury. His uh, initial ECG was normal, and uh, so he was referred to family medical clinic for the follow up of hypertension. Uh, so uh, i asked about the his presenting complaint it is on and off burning type chest pain it, the onset was after meals and it's aggravated with fatty and spicy meals it was not associated with exertion relieved with antacids and uh, he had his all meals home cooked but since he is working in a distant place lunch is prepared in the morning with some oily curries so uh, he had regurgitation Uh, it looked like uh, gastroesophageal reflux and this hypertension was an incidental finding and uh, at the family medical clinic also he had a blood pressure of 150 by 90 so this is a newly diagnosed hypertensive patient and how can we manage this patient uh, this is to mention that this is the first time his blood pressure was measured in his life at the opd so uh, what are the uh, requirements what are the screening guidelines uh, available for uh, screening for hypertension uh, us preventive task force recommends to measure office blood pressure as a screening for uh, 18 to 39 year old people and if the blood pressure is normal then we have to measure it once in every 3 to 5 years but uh, for more than 40 years we should measure the blood pressure at least annually some guidelines said uh, differently but uh, it's the guideline so since mr uh, is presented with some uh, chest pain it's a basic assessment according to his presenting complaint and uh, his age is 42 years it's a part of the holistic care we provide then uh, this is the sorry so the epidemiology of hypertension i would like to uh, consider in this moment uh, so uh, <clears throat> world population is reaching 8 billion and uh, it's estimated that 1.4 billion of that worldwide have high blood pressure but only 14% have it under control 
it significantly increases the risk of cardiovascular, cerebrovascular, as well as renal disease. So, uh, cardiovascular disease is the main cause of mortality globally. And over three quarters of this CBD and uh, stroke related deaths occur in low and middle income countries. It's uh, the same for no income countries like us. So, uh, it's highly prevalent. And uh, this is the epidemiology in Sri Lanka. Uh, there were several studies done previously. Uh, for example, in uh, 1988 also, I could found one study done in Central Province. It uh, said uh, the prevalence of hypertension was 43.5%. Uh, and uh, Dr. Shanti Mendes has done it. Done it. And uh, the re recently in 2014, Dr. Katulanda has done this study where it showed 23.7% uh, prevalence in all adults. And uh, it increased prevalence was seen in with physical inactivity, presence of diabetes, central obesity, and Sri Lankan Moa ethnicity. With odds ratio above 1.5. And uh, more in a more recent study, we could see a definite rise of the same trend, especially in the rural population. The prevalence of hypertension was 26.3. And of these, only 17.3 have achieved target. Already diagnosed patient, only 17.3 have achieved targets. And uh, since I was interested in hypertension, I did my uh, first cycle of audit at DH Moratua. And we found that of the 100 patients we assessed, assessed only 27 have achieved targets. So it's uh, going on with, with the same uh, details. Uh, hypertension target achievement is comparatively low. And uh, last week, uh, Professor uh, showed us the most recent evidence. And uh, it showed that according to JNC7 definition, uh, in a reason, 2022 uh, study, prevalence of hypertension in Sri Lanka is 28.2. And according to that American guidelines with the lower cutoff of hypertension, 130 by 80, the prevalence has risen to 51.3. So uh, still uh, most recent guidelines are going with 140 by 90 cutoff. So uh, we can go on with that 28.2, still the trends are rising. So the burden of hypertension globally is so high that even in the height of the COVID epidemic, we could see uh, three new guidelines have uh, been published. NICE guideline in 2019, it's just before the COVID, and then ISH guideline in 2020 and WHO guideline for primary care in 2021. So uh, he referred to these five guidelines for various uh, data in my presentation. And uh, the management part, I mainly uh, focused on NICE, ISH, and WHO, the most recent ones. <clears throat> so uh, the definition of hypertension, we are still seeking for a consensus that uh, it's just not uh, drawing a bell-shaped curve and uh, telling that 95% uh, are inside the normal population and then 2.5% are outside the normality, uh, above the normal range, like that. Uh, it's not as simple as that. So the definition of hypertension is the level of blood pressure at which the benefits of treatment, either with lifestyle interventions or drugs, unequivocally outweigh the risks of treatment as documented by clinical trials. So uh, of these five guidelines, four of them use office systolic blood pressure values of 140 and diastolic blood pressure values of more than 90 as the cutoff, just because it's the treatment cutoff. So this is the WHO treatment cutoffs in the most recent guideline 2021. Uh, it says uh, in simple hypertensives, 140 by 90 is the treatment cutoff. And for those with 
existing cardiovascular disease or with high cardiovascular risk, diabetes or chronic kidney disease, we have to start treatment at 130 by 139, about one, uh, when the blood pressure is above 130. So uh, then I will move on to blood pressure measurement. What is ideal, what is optimal, what is practical and what we are doing actually. We can uh, see, look back and see. So why we measure blood pressure? I discussed this uh, already to screen for hypertension, to monitor the effectiveness of management. And uh, there are several to estimate cardiovascular risk. And when we are determining risk of medical or surgical procedures, and also in uh, monitoring patients ongoing clinical status. In the primary care, we can uh, <coughs> measure blood pressure at office, or we can measure blood pressure as out of office. Uh, out of office blood pressure measurement can be done by ambulatory blood pressure monitoring or home blood pressure monitoring. So this slide, I think uh, Dr. Lakmal explained very well. I want to add that uh, the <laughs> what is the standard bladder cuff? The correct size is 80% of the uh, mid-arm circumference is the correct width of the bladder. And 40% of the mid-arm circumference is the correct uh, width of bladder, uh, length and width. And also, uh, study has shown that, especially if we are using a larger cuff, the, this truncated cone shape of the uh, bladder cuff is uh, important for measuring the taking the correct measurement. So we have seen some uh, blood pressure cuffs with this kind of truncated cone shape uh, uh, cuffs. So uh, of this various steps, Dr. Lakmal described that day. What is the impact of each step? We have to know. Then we will know what is the most important thing we should do at measuring blood pressure. One is, uh, I want to highlight that when, when the patient talk during the measurement, it can raise cyclic blood pressure by 17 millimeters of mercury and diastolic by 13. And uh, also if the patient is not resting more than five minutes and not in a quiet temp environment, it can uh, increase the systolic blood pressure by 12 and diastolic by six. And if we are not using the correct cuff size, especially if the cuff is too small, it can cause a rise of blood pressure systolic by six to 18. So these three steps are the most uh, impactful steps we should ensure when we are measuring blood pressure. Specification, I won't go into detail because the presentation is lengthy. I will uh, just go through. So, uh, in uh, Ms. Tess, we measured, uh, I measured blood pressure in both arms and there was no arm to arm difference. And repeated in 20 minutes, the blood pressure was same. So, I diagnosed grade one hypertension in Mr. S. Why arm to arm difference? Just to mention that uh, I think. You all know the causes for arm to arm difference, severe AR, peripheral vascular disease, aortic dissection, coarctation, and vasculitis. But uh, in addition, uh, a systolic blood pressure difference of more than 10 millimeters of mercury between arms should be adapted as the upper limit of normal. And if that is more than that, it predicts increased all cause mortality, increased cardiovascular mortality, and also increased cardiovascular event risk. So uh, arm to, measuring arm to arm difference, at least at the diagnosis of a patient is very important at the first diagnosis. So we will move on to out of office blood pressure measurements. What is home-based blood pressure monitoring? We advise many patients to do home-based blood pressure monitoring. Is it just the blood pressure measured at home? No. Home blood based blood pressure monitoring. We need to advise the patient correctly to get the maximum of, out of the procedure. So uh, it's 
should be done on at least three consecutive days using a validated semi-automatic blood pressure monitor. It's a way of self blood pressure monitoring. And we should include readings in the mornings and evenings, not night blood pressure measurements. Very important because uh, when we are measuring blood pressure at night, the process of measuring blood pressure itself may increase systolic and diastolic blood pressure. But when we are doing the ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, it's not like that. Because anxiety and all those factors will not affect the blood pressure. So if we take night blood pressure measurements at self blood pressure monitoring, it may raise the average of the blood pressure we measure. And patient should be seated in a quiet room for five minutes. And each day, average of two measurements one to two minute apart should be done. So we should have at least six blood pressure readings and get the average of that for the ideal home blood pressure monitoring. And the other way, other method is ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, where a patient must wear a device for usually 24 hours and daytime average, nighttime average and 24 hour average is calculated automatically. It's not freely available. It's around uh, 4,000 to 500, 5,000 rupees cost. And uh, so uh, this is a uh, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring report. So we can see the blood pressure averages were given at a 24 hour average, 120.4 by 81. Daytime BP average, 123 by 84. And night blood pressure average is 112 by 72, 73, which is comparatively low. So uh, this is a person I personally know and his blood pressure when measured at hospital was about 150 and 160 at times. So uh, this is a case of white coat hypertension. We will discuss uh, white coat hypertension later, but uh, the diagnostic cutoffs of hypertension we should be familiar with. For the office blood pressure measurement, it is 140 by 90. And for ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, uh, the daytime average and home blood pressure mean is similar, 135 by 85. 24 hour average, 24 hour average is 130 by 80, and nighttime average is 120 by 70. So those are the mm, cutoffs for diagnosis of hypertension. And uh, Indications for home blood pressure monitoring or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, we will discuss this later after learning more about white coat and mast hypertension. So when the office blood pressure measurement and out of office blood pressure measurement are discordant, we are defining white coat hypertension and mast hypertension. If the uh, out of office uh, blood pressure measurement is high and the office blood pressure measurement is normal. This group, we are called them masked hypertension and it's about 10% of the population. And white coat hypertension is when the office blood pressure measurement is always high, but, but the home blood pressure measurement is normal. So, uh, White coat hypertension prevalence is 30 to 40 percent among those who have elevated office blood pressure. It's comparatively very high. And uh, it is common with increasing age, women, non smokers, and those with grade one blood pressure, grade one hypertension at office measurement. And masked hypertension is the untreated patients in whom blood pressure is normal in the office, but is elevated when measured by home blood pressure monitoring or arterial, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So these patients may have hypertension mediated organ damage and they have normal blood pressure at office. Then we should have to be vigilant to uh, identify them. Uh, and prevalence is about 15% among those with normal office blood pressure. It's common in younger people, men, smokers, and those with alcohol use, high physical activity, anxiety, and job stress. 
we have to compare this with the white coat hypertension where it is com common in increasing age women non smokers so white coat hypertension carries intermediate cardiovascular risk and mast hypertension carries similar cardiovascular risk as, risk as sustained hypertension. So the previous uh, <clears throat> evidence was that uh, low total, say, uh, if the low to, uh, total cardiovascular risk is low and there is no organ damage, drug treatment may not be prescribed for white coat hypertension. And we have to uh, advise it lifestyle changes. But uh, and, more recent study in, uh, I think, 2022, February, it showed that even white coat hypertension without organ damage has a increased cardiovascular mortality as well as all cause mortality compared to normotensives. So uh, the now research is uh, heading towards uh, whether we should treat white coat hypertension just like the sustained hypertensives. White coat hypertension without organ damage is not an innocent condition. That's the take home message. And uh, we have to look back and think for secondary causes. I think uh, we had a good discussion about this slide where young adults only having 5% prevalence of secondary causes. And uh, I will move further because uh, if we consider the prevalence of secondary causes, obstructive sleep apnea, primary hyperaldosteronism, and renovascular hypertension are the most common. And uh, those like coarctation, Cushing's, hypothyroidism, pheochromocytoma, PCKD, and acromegaly are very rare comparatively. So at the primary level, I think uh, it's very uh, rational to do a serum electrolyte rather than uh, arranging uh, urinary metanephrine, so something, uh, some uh, high, uh, high profile investigation. And uh, we, I think we just discussed the drugs causing hypertension during last presentation. Uh, I got the interesting point to highlight that uh, paracetamol, when taken as a chronic use, daily use of paracetamol, can increase the relative risk of hypertension. And uh, especially in people with osteoarthritis and uh, rheumatoid arthritis, we have to uh, consider the use of paracetamol as a cause of hypertension. We can uh, consider that. And hypertension mediated organ damage, I'm going to skip because uh, Dr. Lakmal discussed that. So the management. The management of hypertension includes assessment, risk stratification, and defining the targets of control, non-pharmacological management, pharmacological management, as well as follow-up. So the history uh, and uh, I would like to uh, fast forward these slides because, but I can't, uh, Forget this slide. We are, as the family physicians, we have to uh, focus on this slide especially because, uh, especially newly diagnosed and those with poor control, we have to assess the patient's perception, beliefs about the disease, worries, expectations, the psychosocial impact of the disease, the psychosocial background may be a contributory factor for the poor control and also reasons for non-adherence to therapy. That's the part where we family physicians have a special role. And consider this box as a role, as a uh, defining thing for our management. So it's like this, hypertension is not a single disease entity and the patient, hypertension and the society, community, family, uh, social facts, psychological factors, everything, interact and we have to consider all these things when we are managing a patient. So in the systemic inquiry of uh, Mr. S, he had uh, almost normal systemic inquiry. 
and uh, in the psychological assessment, I could see that uh, his mood is slightly low. He's worried about his family economy, like we all these days. And uh, sleep, not affected. And he is sleeping more than six hours. And he has job stress because the uh, his work was at a uh, risk. He has not receiving many jobs as earlier. He had no features of anxiety and no forgetfulness. And the dietary history, uh, he had all his meals home cooked with some oily curries. And he is using salty foods when he used bites when consuming alcohol. And uh, dried fish was a common ingredient in his meals. And he agreed to ask his wife to wash with warm water to reduce salt and not to add additional salt. And the substance use, uh, he was a smoker, one to two cigarettes per day, and he's willing to stop. The alcohol uh, he used once or twice a week, quarter to half a bottle of Arak with friends. Uh, the cage screening was zero, and uh, he has not considered stopping. There's no family disharmony, and there are no social problems associated with his alcohol use. And uh, in the <coughs> family history, had a significant family history. His father died at 53 years due to a CVA. And his elder brother had hypertension and ischemic heart disease. In the social history, uh, I already told he's a carpenter. He has, he's a father of two children with an 80 year old daughter and 13 year old son. And he had two questions. Should I continue drugs for lifelong? And I don't have any symptoms. Why should I take drugs? I think most of the hypertensives have this problem in their minds. And his uh, BMI was 32.4. He's uh, <clears throat> uh, class, having class one obesity. And uh, he had nicotine stains. His neck circumference was 43. And uh, suggestive of obstructive sleep apnea. I think I couldn't mention in the history he had features of obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, also <clears throat> the cardiovascular examination was normal except for the high blood pressure. Uh, abdomen was normal. I couldn't perform ophthalmoscopy because of unavailability. And in summary, <clears throat> Mr. Sum uh, S, a 42 year old male carpenter from Coralavella presented to the family medical clinic with newly diagnosed hypertension. Incidentally found when he was presented with burning chest pain for three weeks due to gastroesophageal reflux. His hypertension was uncomplicated with hypertension mediated organ damage and a positive family history of increased cardiovascular risk, smoking, alcohol, class 1 obesity, and obstructive sleep apnea were found as possible positive associations. Work related stress and mild low mood due to economic instability may also be contributed. He is worried whether he needs to take drugs lifelong and questions the need to start drugs as he is asymptomatic. So we did the routine investigations. Uh, only ECG was available at that time. Uh, <clears throat> so we planned full blood count, UFR, fasting blood sugar, lipid profile, SGOTPT, and serum creatinine estimated GFR. And uh, in the next clinic visits, we were planned to do the specific investigations if necessary. So before starting treatment, we have to stratify risk. This is the treatment guideline. This is the American College of Cardiologists guideline. Grade one hypertension, all the grades, high normal blood pressure as well as grade one, grade two, grade three. We start with lifestyle advice. And grade two and grade three, immediately we have to start drugs. For the grade one hypertensives, we can consider starting drugs immediately in those who are having very high risk of cardiovascular disease, already having cardiovascular disease, renal disease or hypertension mediated organ damage. If the <clears throat> risk is low or moderate without cardiovascular disease, renal disease or hypertension mediated organ damage, we can uh, give a lifestyle modification trial for three to six months and see whether blood pressure is controlled or not. If not controlled, we have to start drugs. The same thing is stated in the ISH guideline in 2020. 
So the cardiovascular risk factors, I think this list is you are very familiar. And in addition, there are some diseases that increase cardiovascular risk, like rheumatoid arthritis, SLD, systemic sclerosis, COPD, psychiatric disorders, and psychosocial stressors. You have to consider those also. And then <clears throat> we are considering the cardiovascular risk factors to assess the cardiovascular risk. This is the ISH guideline, a simpler one. We can use very easily. Um, so Mr. S is having grade one hypertension. And of, the, of those cardiovascular risk factors, up to now he is having uh, smoking and family history. We don't know his diabetes status, dyslipidemia, other things, but these two cardiovascular risk factors are there. So he is having moderate risk of having cardiovascular disease in the next 10 years. This is one method, but for Sri Lanka, most uh, validated method is WHO risk stratification charts for Southeast Asia in 2019. With that, we have two charts. One is with the laboratory evidence, where serum cholesterol, total cholesterol level is considered. Uh, and the other with, without in laboratory investigations. They consider only the age, smoking, non-smoking status, sex, uh, systolic blood pressure, and body mass index. So when we consider mistakes, his uh, cardiovascular risk was 8%. That is low risk. So uh, targets of treatment. The 2021 WHO guideline states that uh, targets of treatments are 140 by 90. For, uh, but for those people with high risk, of cardiovascular disease, diabetes and CKD, take the systolic blood pressure target as 130. So <clears throat> it's the target is 140 by 90. And for <clears throat> those with high risk, it's systolic blood pressure less than 130. The ISH guideline is similar. It's the target 140 by 90 and uh, for those with comorbidities, 130 by 80. And patients without comorbidity, if they are tolerating the blood pressure less than 140 by 90, try to control it further up to 130 by 80. That's the target. That's the ISH guideline. That's what ISH guideline states. And especially in the younger people for, who are below 65 years. but not less than 120 by 70. Because there were two trials. One is the sprint trial, right? Uh, stated, states that intensive versus standard blood pressure control in non-diabetic patients. Uh, when we were intensively controlling blood pressure less than 120 millimeters, it resulted actually lower rates of fatal and non-fatal major cardiovascular events and death, but there were significantly higher rates of adverse events. So it was not uh, beneficial when we consider uh, the risk versus benefit. That's why they say intensive blood pressure control below 120 is not necessary. Similar results were found in <laughs> ACCORD study where they uh, compared intensive blood pressure and uh, non-intensive general blood pressure control in type two diabetics. But here they have not found any significant uh, reduction of composite outcome of fatal and non-fatal major cardiovascular events. So it was not beneficial also. The non-pharmacological management, Lifestyle modification is the first line management for all grades of hypertension. It has, it can prevent or delay the onset of origin, very important. For those who are at high risk, we can uh, 
give the primary prevention as lifestyle modifications. There are five arms mentioned in the ISH guideline, diet, reduction of weight and obesity, smoking cessation, mindfulness and stress management, and reduced exposure to air pollution and cold temperature. I think it's a quite non-modifiable in our setup. Mm. <clears throat> so uh, dietary modifications, the recommended is the DASH diet, uh, a diet rich in whole grains, fruits, vegetables, UFAs, and uh, dairy products. And uh, in addition, low salt. WHO recommendation is less than five grams per day. Uh, it should include less than five grams and the sodium level should be two grams. But in uh, 2012 National Population Salt Consumption Survey in Sri Lanka, the per person salt com consumption per day was 10.5 grams. So it's almost double. Reduced salt addition at food preparation and limit consumption of high salt foods is what we should advise to the patients and not to add salt, especially for uh, salty foods. And also leafy vegetables, avocados, nuts, seeds, legumes, they are, uh, they are high intake can affect uh, positively, but I don't know how practical these advisors in our setup. And reducing sugar, saturated fats, and trans fats are also beneficial. Regarding coffee use, caffeine, there is a slight difference in two guidelines. NICE guideline states that uh, night guideline, NICE guideline discourages excessive consumption of coffee and caffeine rich products, while the ISH guideline says moderate consumption of healthy drinks like coffee. So it states coffee as a healthy drink. And uh, when I researched for literature, it also was uh, equivocal. There were some reports saying coffee is healthy, some reports said uh, unhealthy in the context of hypertension. And uh, weight reduction and avoiding obesity. People who are at risk of overweight, overweight and obese, all these three groups are benefit from weight reduction. The main modes of weight reduction are calorie reduction, regular exercise, and avoiding sedentary lifestyle. So uh, life, the exercise, I think we all know that five to seven days a week, 30 minutes per day, aerobic and resistance exercises of moderate in intensity. Other uh, <coughs> ISH uh, recommendations. And uh, we should know the impact of each of the managing interventions. And this is the ISH uh, guideline telling that antihypertensives decrease systolic blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury and DASH diet has an impact of 11. Reduced alcohol 4 millimeters, increased exercise 4 to 5 millimeters and losing weight 1 millimeter of mercury per kilogram, losing, uh, kilogram loss. So, uh, if, the, if a patient is having a poor blood pressure control, we can consider these as options for the patient. That's the that's a take home message. So uh, at last, we are moving to pharmacological management. I think uh, we have about 15 minutes. Uh, I don't know, I have rushed through. Uh, so, uh, this is the ISH guideline. I think we went through this. Uh, all the grade two hypertensives and above, we have to immediately start drugs and grade one, we can uh, wait for three to six months if they are having not for, uh, no, if they are not having comorbidities. What are the ideal drugs for hypertension? The treatment should be evidence-based in relation to morbidity and mortality. And it's better to use a once a daily regime which provide 24 hour blood pressure control. As well as I think it improves compliance very much. Treatment should be affordable and cost effective relative to other agents. Treatment should be well tolerated and evidence of benefits of use of the medication in populations to which it is to be applied. 
So this is the 2019 NICE guideline. It says that below 55, we start with the AC inhibitor ARB. And above 55, and for the black people, we start with calcium channel blocker. And uh, in the sec second step, if the blood pressure targets are not achieved, we combine AC inhibitors or ARBs with calcium channel blocker. In the third step, we add a diuretic. And in the step four, we diagnose resistant hypertension. So uh, in the ISH guideline, it's a little different. In the 2020 guideline, they say, we have to start with the low dose combination, single dose therapy. Uh, actually, these kind of pills are not available in Sri Lanka, I, as far as I know. Uh, AC inhibitors or ARBs with calcium channel blockers combined. And in the step two, we can double the dose and do a full dose combination. And in the third step, we use triple combination, AC inhibitors or ARBs, calcium channel blockers and diuretics. That is the same as NICE guideline, third step. And fourth step, we can add spironolactone to the, these three drugs. Or else we can add some other drug like alpha blocker. So uh, <clears throat> WHO guideline, in 2021 for primary care, it was a little uh, easier to practice and very uh, descriptive. It has two algorithms, algorithm one and two. Algorithm one follows the ISH guideline where they start with the ARB CCP combination at half maximum doses. They are giving example as telmisartan 40 milligram and amlodipine 5 milligram. We don't have a combination but we can start with two tablets. And uh, we have to always recheck blood pressure in four to six weeks. If the BP is not reaching goal, uh, reaching the goal, we have to go to next step. If the BP is at goal, we can follow up the patient in three to six months. So the second step is, just like the ISH guideline, we double the combination. Tell me certain 80 and amlodipine 10. And uh, if the BP is not at goal, in the second step, the next step is adding thiazide and thi adding thiazide at half maximum dose. For example, hydrochlorothiazide, 25 milligram or chlorothalidone, 12.5. And we can recheck blood pressure in four to six weeks whether they have achieved the goals. And if the BP is not at goal in the third step, we can double the thiazide dose. Hydrochlorothiazide 50 or clothalidone 25. And still not reaching the <clears throat> goals, we can refer him to a specialist. This is the first algorithm. And the second algorithm, they advise to start at, with the calcium channel blocker at half maximum dose, amlodipine. And then uh, they advise to double the calcium channel blocker dose. In the next step, add an ARB or AC inhibitor, then uh, double the ARB dose. Next step, thiazide half at half dose, and then at the thiazide, double dose. This is the WHO guideline where they specifically advise us to stepwise increase the drug doses, doubling them. Now, in the next sli few slides, I will discuss why this calcium channel blocker has come here instead of AC inhibitors, as well as why we are stepping up like this. <clears throat> now, now all the, almost all the guidelines highlight that it's the amount of blood pressure reduction that is the major determinant of cardiovascular risk reduction in both young and older patients, but not the choice of the antihypertensive drug, even for patients with increased cardiovascular risk. Monotherapy, we can start with uh, low dose thiazides, long acting AC inhibitors or ARBs, or long acting dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. Uh, when we are using monotherapy as diuretics, thiazide like diuretics are preferred to thiazide. 
the thiazide like diuretics we know are clothalidone and indepamide. I think indepamide is available in Sri Lanka. Clothalidone, I'm not much familiar with. So uh, we will consider reasons for individual drugs. AC inhibitors are considered first line therapy for all who have heart failure, asymptomatic LV dysfunction, all patients who had STEMI and non STEMI with entry infarction, diabetes, cystic dysfunction, and CKD. So, uh, what is better, AC inhibitors or ARBs? Uh, actually, there is no compelling evidence to use AC inhibitors or ARBs as such. But uh, directly targeting angiotensin 1 receptors has advantages. One is the well known reduced uh, dry cough due to bradykinin metabolism. I think uh, you're familiar with the physiology and pharmacology behind that. And angiotensin 2 produced by non AC pathways can be inhibited when AC, uh, when they are uh, used, we can uh, inhibit the angiotensin 2 produced by non AC pathways. And the risk of angioedema is greatly reduced. It is a idiosyncratic reaction. It's uh, the ARBs, you, when you are using ARBs, it's reduced. And there is only one <coughs> uh, certain indication for ARB over ACI. That is severe hypertension with ECG evidence of left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, the LIFE trial had some uh, light on this. LIFE trial was mainly about uh, losartan and atinlol. And uh, most recently about sacubitril losartan and uh, sacubitril alone. Uh, but uh, also it says uh, for this indication, ARBs are better over ACI. And uh, in patients who do not tolerate ACI due to cough. And calcium channel blockers. There are no absolute preferences. Long-acting dihydropyridines are preferred, amlodipine and nifedipine SR. There are non-dihydropyridines like uh, verapamil and diltiazem, which are used in certain specific investigations, like rate control of atrial fibrillation or control of angina. And they are not used in heart failure. Also, calcium channel blockers are preferred in patients with obstructive airway diseases, like uh, asthma and COPD. So thiazides, uh, especially preferred in patients with hypertension and osteoporosis. Uh, I think uh, all had trial. Uh, those who were treated with clothalidone had significantly fewer hip fractures compared to lisinopril and amlodipine. I think uh, all had trial compared clothalidone, lisinopril, amlodipine, and doxazosine. And doxazosinam was uh, stopped due to hyper, uh, increased uh, some uh, adverse effects. So uh, these three drugs are compared as a cohort. And uh, it's an additional information that came through this trial. And also thiazides were important for volume control of heart failure, CKD, and uh, hypertension, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction as well as heart failure with reserved, uh, reduced ejection fraction. <coughs> thiazide like diuretics, as I mentioned earlier, they are preferred to hydrochlorothiazide. And uh, also thiazides could be used in those, use, uh, those intolerant to calcium channel blockers. Calcium channel blockers commonly cause ankle edema and some other side effects then we can use diuretics instead. And increasing diuretic dose has minimal effect on reduction of blood pressure. I will discuss later. So uh, there was a recent cohort study for uh, assessing first-line drug treatment for hypertension and reduction in blood pressure according to age and ethnicity. This was done in United Kingdom primary care. There are 87,000 new users of AC inhibitors and uh, 67,000 new users of calcium channel blockers and 22,000 new users of thiazides are compared. <clears throat> this was published in uh, 2020 BMJ. It uh, showed that 
they have reviewed the patients at 12 weeks, 26 weeks, and 52 weeks, <clears throat> and found that there is no significant difference between calcium channel blockers versus AC inhibitors or ARBs, as well as thiazides versus CCBs. So the conclusions were, there is no statistically significant difference in achieving blood pressure targets with AC inhibitors or ARBs or calcium channel blockers or thiazides. And age might not be the best factor to determine drug choice. Calcium channel blocker produced greater blood pressure reduction in those above 75 years of age and not above the 55 years of age. And uh, calcium channel blockers produced large blood pressure reductions in black people versus non-black. <clears throat> so uh, we are assessing response to monotherapy after four to six weeks. And the, uh, at the assessment, we are checking for the target, whether it's 140 by 90 or at least 20 to by 20, 10 millimeter reduction. If not achieving target, doses increase. So with dose titration is limited to only one step. It's very important. We double the dose only once, tell me certain 40 to 80, losartan 25 to 50, amlodipine 5 to 10, clothalidone 12.5 to 25, HCT, like that. We only double once. The reason is this. When we consider the dose response curves of the drug for the antihypertensives, this is the dose response curve and this is the side defect curve, adverse effects curve. When we are doubling the dose, the therapeutic, in the therapeutic window, the dose response curve is very steep. So we will get a good increase in the dose uh, effect. But if we further increase the dose, the graph is like a plateau here. So uh, the adverse effects will start to rise. That's the reason why, uh, why we only uh, increase the dose once by one step. For, so if they are non-responders, we can change the drug type, we can change the drug class, or else we can go for combination therapy. Combination therapy, uh, we can combine usually long-acting AC inhibitors with long-acting dihydropyridines. We already discussed this. And uh, thiazides are better for obese to combine with AC or inhibitors so are this for none of these always go for ac inhibitors and calcium channel blockers mm. <clears throat> the accomplished trial compared uh, ac inhibitors and amlodipine versus hydrochlorothiazide and found that ac inhibitors and uh, amlodipine combination was better so i think this is the basis of this is one of the uh, Confounding factor for this combination therapy where we prefer AC inhibitors is calcium channel blockers. And uh, beta blockers and alpha blockers, I think uh, we should not uh, worry much because they are beyond the resistant hypertension patients for the resistant hypertension patients. And uh, I think uh, you are familiar with this drug where the compelling, compelling indications are mentioned. For it's almost always AC inhibitors and ARBs, but uh, recurrent stroke prevention, it's AC inhibitors and diuretic. Uh, in pregnancy, labitalol, nifedipine, and methyl dopa. And uh, for CKD stage four, it's uh, calcium channel blockers are preferred. Uh, in uh, heart failure, AC inhibitors, diuretics, Peripheral vascular disease, AC inhibitors, and calcium channel blockers. And for stroke, thiazides and calcium channel blockers. And also for rheumatic disorders, also we can uh, use renin angiotensin inhibitors, calcium channel blockers, and diuretics. For psychiatric disorders, uh, it's better to avoid calcium channel blockers because of orth orthostatic hypertension with SSRIs. And, uh, diuretics and uh, AC inhibitors are better used. 
So in summary, grade one hypertension is treated with monotherapy or combination therapy and response is assessed in four to six weeks. Major determinant of risk reduction is not the choice of drug, but the amount of blood pressure reduction. And overt control of targets do not produce benefits compared to risk of side effects. And not achieving targets with monotherapy, we can change the drug group to escalate those or to change it to combination therapy. The finding the most suitable drug for the patient is an evidence-based diet. So we managed mistress according to this uh, principles. I think uh, I'm running out of time. So uh, for the completion, I will say the resistant hypertension is uh, office blood pressure of one, more than 140 by 90 measure with that while patient is on at least three antihypertensives, including a diuretic. And we have to explore pseudo-resistant hypertension like white coat defect, non-adherence treatment, incorrect blood pressure measurements, and secondary causes as uh, contributors. So we have to prefer the patient if, they are, if we are suspecting a secondary cause, if there is evidence of target organ damage for the management of those specific conditions, and if the young onset, resistant hypertension, if suspecting white coat or mask hypertension, and for the investigations, and patients with multiple drug intolerances. So uh, hypertension is a cause of morbidity and mortality globally and locally. Also, it is on the rising trends of prevalence. Multiple blood pressure measurements, office or out of office, adhering to correct technique are required to correctly diagnose hypertension. Assessment includes comprehensive history, examination, and investigations to identify secondary causes, to assess cardiovascular risk, and to screen for hypertension-mediated organ damage. Uh, hypertension-mediated organ damage affects brain, eye, heart, kidneys, and peripheral arteries mainly. And several management guidelines emphasize the importance of non-pharmacological as well as pharmacological interventions. Masked and white coat hypertension are diagnostic challenges, while resistant hypertension is a challenge for management. So uh, hypertension is a vast topic to discuss. I think uh, I have uh, done uh, something uh, <coughs> a difficult task in uh, summarizing all these facts into one hour discussion. Thank you. These are my references. Thank you, Prabhat. Thank you very much. Uh, anybody uh, any questions you can ask now? Um, can I make a small comment? Uh. Hello, I'm Shane. Yeah, uh, so Prabhata, it's like a me, presentation at a me, you know, annual session or something like that, actually. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Comprehensive. Me, so just, just like to, uh, you know, give a few comments uh, also. Me, now, uh, this uh, cardiovascular risk prediction, yes. uh, there's this recent study done in Ragama. May they have followed up patients for 10 years mm -hmm. and uh, you know using the WHO risk prediction yes. and uh, so they have done that and also they have developed their own model of mm -hmm. risk prediction and uh, uh, and using the Sri Lanka the, the new model they have detected 90 uh, 90 more uh, cardiovascular events uh, compared to the WHO risk prediction. So like even the, you know, what we are using now, the WHO risk prediction will miss quite a lot of uh, cardiovascular events. So I think uh, in the future, we, 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 we could expect the Sri Lankan model also to predict, predict cardiovascular, you know, events. And, uh, you know, which includes hypertension as well. And also just want to make another comment. Most of our 
treatment guidelines are based on uh, studies done in Europe and America and all that. And, B, and also we are using the BNF uh, for most of our drug dosage, yes. which is also mostly based on, uh, you know, UK patients. Yes. Sometimes, uh, I don't know how far we can go with this data uh, in, for the, in the future. And, uh, and the other thing is, uh, with this economic crisis and all that, I don't know how far is practical it is to really, you know, give the state of the art uh, pharmacological therapy because uh, some of the drugs are not available. Sometimes, you know, amlodipine is not there, losartan is there, sometimes losartan is there, amlodipine is not there like that. You know, we encounter these uh, situations quite a lot. And also, uh, a lot of research has found that uh, the reason why still hypertension is not controlled and, you know, uh, we are not re reaching targets is because uh, one reason is patients are not actually taking those drugs. Yes. You know, uh, maybe like 80% or 70% only they are taking. Also, the day they are coming to the clinic, they are not taking. And also there are so many social factors. Uh, you know, they are not taking the drug, which, which we can't really find out by doing a research or audit sometimes and uh, and the other thing is uh, uh, they have found that developing countries it's going i mean uh, all these things are rising mainly because of these simple things like uh, poor diet uh, physical inactivity and alcohol and smoking so as yeah. primary care physicians actually I feel we have to like aggressively address these uh, risk factors. So, I mean, if we can control, especially those risk factors, we can control a lot of, uh, you know, cardiovascular mortality and morbidity we are getting. And so, which is actually a very difficult thing. And uh, another thing is, uh, one last thing is obesity. Yes. Uh, they have found that, uh, you know, morbid obesity and grade two obesity, there is a huge improvement with uh, what you call this metabolic surgery. I mean, in this patient, we are not, uh, you know, in that category. Yes. For example, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if they undergo this metabolic surgery, diabetes, hypertension, obstructive sleep apnea, and dyslipidemia, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, everything just almost uh, disappears or like get resolved. So uh, I think as primary care, physician, primary care physicians, we have to refer early, uh, early as possible to these centers also. I think that's what I wanted to say altogether. Yes. Thank you, Shane. Uh, there are a lot of points uh, in your little uh, speech. Uh, one thing, uh, I think uh, you mentioned that uh, we, as family physicians can uh, act on this, all these uh, steps, not only pharmacological management, but also diet, alcohol, reduction, increased exercise, losing weight, and also risk factor management. <clears throat> and also we have a role in improving compliance as well as uh, uh, adherence to treatment. Treatment mean not only the pharmacological treatment, but also to the instructions. So uh, that's one thing. The other thing is uh, the uh, Sri Lankan data. It's very important to have our data and uh, data customized to us to um, uh, develop our guidelines, not only for pharmacological uh, drug dosing and all those things, but also as prevalence it's studies, it's very important to know our prevalence correctly, risk reduction, everything. So, uh, the, your points are well uh, taken, Jane. Thanks. Shane, it's what, excuse me, Shane, it's uh, for you. You mentioned about this, uh, you know, the metabolic surgeries. Is it, could you refer the bariatric surgeries? Is it? Yes, madam. Yeah. Yeah. And could you please give me the, the association between the OSA and how to reduce OSA with bariatric surgeries? 
Uh, yeah, madam. Uh, especially uh, uh, bariatric surgery, the criteria is uh, BMI more than 35 with, uh, with also comorbidities and also uh, BMI more than 40. So uh, uh, they have studied that. Uh, no, I mean, like the bariatric surgeries, what they like more concerned about the, you know, the truncal obesity is like this. They take the, like, the fat from the abdominal, actually abdominal fat. But always say the reasons could be not only the weight, there are other reasons as well, the causes, I mean. Is it? For the yeah. When we talk about uh, uh, gyatri here, madam, yeah. uh, when we talk about bariatric surgery, that means not only uh, taking out the fat, the truncal fat, madam, uh, we are reducing the stomach content. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but yeah, what, what, what you take is true. But what I'm yeah. asking is so now we are. Yeah, I mean, talking about the, the abdomen, not mm -hmm. that was the cause. So the OSA, not only those like below the thorax, like we have some other reasons why the patient has OSA. Madam, uh, yeah, it says that uh, the fat around the uh, pharynx area also get reduced with the reduction of the uh, body weight, madam. The I, neck I, circumference has obesity, a, I mean the yeah the neck the circumference is you know yeah. these are the criteria for to diagnose OSA. So what I'm mm -hmm. asking is the only the fat can cause the huge neck circumference. No, madam. Mm -hmm. uh, if the large tongue size can be reduced, yeah, uh, the large tongue size. What are yeah. the other things? And also uh, the uh, there are. There are many ENT surgeons uh, doing this kind of uh, yeah, the, the, the bony, bony, the acromegaly. Yes, it could be that. What else? Acromegaly as well it, as uh, glands, uh, adenoids, and uh, of course, Yes. Yep. So that's the thing because always say, of course, we can. Sorry, we can say there's a if the reason other than those things, the cause always is that then the bariatric or the metabolic surgeries will help. So we had to like correct it that way. Otherwise, so it's not the only way out for the OSS because it's, we cannot like talk about or like sort of treatment for OSS without losing body weight. That's very true. But that we say, we have to exclude all the other possibilities for OSS. I think we had to correct that part. Okay, if there are no other things, I have some other concerns. If we we'll, we'll let the others to talk, and I'll come to that later. Can I can I raise my voice as well, Prabhat? Yes, madam. Thank. You. Thank you. Regarding this bariatric surgery, that's good that you all have pointed out the metabolic surgery. So, the, so I have inquired from uh, four or five patients that who have undergone uh, for that, and you know. Uh, uh, their experience is right. They have drastically reduced the weight. The the we are, uh, the, the more, more morbidities pertaining to you know the obesity have been reduced. That's correct. But you know they are really really uh, out of five patients which I have inquired, I of course even couldn't recognize those patients because those. Uh, two patients known to me very well when they were fat. But after the surgery, I couldn't even recognize that much of they have gone down and thinned down. So uh, I asked their experience. So they were take, they were telling, even though they are, that's a superb solution as Shane correctly mentioned, for most of the, you know, the morbid, the obesity related, uh, the diseases. But, you know, they say they would have uh, control the, the, the diet and exercise to reduce the weight more than this because they were telling it's the skin has become so wrinkled and as well as the weight gain is not there. Even though they yes. take high calorie diet, it's very slow. So it's very slow, the weight gain. And they have to go for extra diets like, you know, the whey protein and artificial diets in order to gain weight a little bit what we expected. 
so they yes. were telling it's a, it's you know the the hard experience for them and once they go into the mirror they really depressed right because of not having their figure as it was so uh, as primary care physicians even though Shane says that it's a good thing i think if we can motivate the patients right correctly to go for this you know the, the reduction of uh, high calorie diet with, because you know to train the brain for two weeks with it's difficult but after that it, they can go so the as primary care physicians i think we have to motivate our patients even though it's a morbid obesity right to go ahead ahead with low calorie diet as well as you know the other possible because if we keep uh, giving appointments, close the the close appointments and monitoring them, they may be motivated. So that is my uh, uh, concern through going through the experience. I am talking, yes, and yes. the other, yeah, number two, uh, you were talking about you know the pharmacological therapy of the hypertension patient management. That's really. Uh, the correct according to the guidelines but you have to be being it's a learning point that i'm going to tell you reflexively yes. i have learned so the patients who are on this long-term hypertensive uh, therapy they uh, the chain told that you know that they have they they don't tend to comply with the therapy so whose fault that is again the primary care physician's fault because we can you know the motivate the patients to go ahead with their compliance the, uh, the compliance uh, by counseling the patient properly telling the importance the complications of this uh, uncontrolled hypertension and uh, the showing the pictorial presentations complications and all not to suffer but to enjoy the life life by going with pharmacological therapy and the other important thing that i want to tell you the take home message is very very important you know i have come across many patients who are very compliant with the therapy but you know the in between they experience the side effect of therapy mm. because it's long-term therapy you whenever the patient comes for follow-up right not this patient this is the initial patient at the time of initiation of the treatment you have to tell the benefits as well as the common side effects of the uh, the antihypertensives right yes. so uh, the commonly postural drops of hyper high antihypertensive therapy they are really getting scared and they stop then and there because hypertension will not give you for most of the patient symptoms so because of that they think why are we taking these tablets lifelong so again that is your duty to explain the common side effects i not only that i uh, come across another serious case this you know uh, the dental surgeon the always you know the complain of i have to share this that's why i'm taking time and tell you always complain of dizziness right dizziness during the daytime uh, around 10 name like it starts and going through the day so this it disturbs her duty so she was thinking that she is getting going to get heart attack no strength you know the to work so she was investigated heavily and even like the faintishness like thing as well heavily with you know the even angiogram was done okay ultimately decide because her husband is a doctor medical officer the famous gp in burlesque gamo area so uh, finally whenever i went there she was looking uh, she was you know the uh, just keeping her head and saying that she has reported to the duty saying that she has no fitness she is dc even though they have gone through several investigations once they have sent to ambulance as well from the hospital that she was working when she gets this disease fails so no, nothing they have found right so i just asked what are the, the the drugs that she was taking the last six months she is getting this 
so when i went through it's a lisinopril you know they have changed the antihypertensive medication to lisinopril right the lisinopril is a drug as given that i according to my knowledge it's lisinopril i can remember me yes so mm -hmm. uh, then that was a drug you know then i just advised her to stop that and go for, for the simple uh, uh the medic uh, the antihypertensive right then again whenever she sees me even today right when she sees me she is working at the police hospital as a dental surgeon sees me she always telling that wait for that you know the identifying that so its take home message is always whenever the patient comes when you are going to start the antihypertensives please you know the be mindful to educate the patients and the relatives for their the side effects if anything that is safety netting anything if they experience to come you know, stop the drug and come to the hospital not stop the drug drug and wait at home right then the, your patient can be saved other than that the patients will be in a dark lot of complications because non compliance okay that's it and uh, your pres the, the your presentation is excellent right you, uh, but you know that the, as i'm always telling you all you have to be patient centered in the management you were not addressed about the, the sleep apnea the sleep apnea and that was also another course apart from the, i can remember the patient and the family history yes, yes ma'am okay right mm -hmm. all right thank you thank you very much Don't waste your time. Do you have any queries? Um, uh, Prabhat, hello. I, yes. Uh, and uh, just uh, one, one thing, uh, another thing uh, which I remembered, um, you know, like uh, about this uh, hypertension and NCDs, uh, most doctors, uh, one of the errors made by doctors, I just want to emphasize, one thing is uh, there's something called clinical inertia where like uh, we see the patient who's hypertensive and also with all the other risk factors sometimes uh, either the doctor is reluctant to start a drug because uh, because it's like a, the patient will be labeled as a long term hypertensive and uh, and all because and also doctors uh, are reluctant sometimes to you know, continue. And also from the patient's point of view, patients are also devastated with the diagnosis and uh, 